Are you always wondering about the things around you? Do you always have the need to find out? Then, this is the show for you. Learn what makes things tick. Or how they simply came to be. Satisfy your curiosity. Welcome to another episode of Curious. Memes. You often see them in social media, a seemingly random picture with a short line of text evoking a humorous and even sometimes a thought-provoking response. Well, mostly. Well, these things are known as memes. But what are they? A meme is like a small packet of culture. Think of it as an idea that is transferred from one person to the other. Now imagine how through its transmission, people end up adding and reshaping the idea itself as it moves. In memetics, or the study of memes, some experts suggest that a meme behaves like a biological process, much like how a disease that gets transmitted and eventually evolves on its own. Sometimes, when a meme fails to grow or attract interest, it all but fades, or as experts suggest, become extinct. When it grows in scope and takes a life of its own, experts liken this to evolution. And while you may think that's purely an internet phenomenon, memes have actually been around for longer. The Kilroy Was Here meme was a popular meme that got spread in the 1940s because of the World War. The meme itself is a drawing of a man with a big nose speaking over a wall and it had a short description, Kilroy was here. A theory suggests that it got spread by soldiers who were stationed around the world. As the meme evolved, variations emerged with the simple drawing and even the name Kilroy. As with the rise of the internet, memes have evolved to its present form. It was shaped by social media sites like 4chan, 9gag, and eventually Facebook. Let's take a look at a few of the most popular ones. Bad Luck Brian is a series of memes depicting a young blonde kid sporting a plaid vest, braces, and a funny smile. Text often depicts the unseemingly unfortunate consequences to Brian's mundane actions. The post actually originated in Reddit during 2012. Overly Attached Girlfriend This meme includes a screen-captured image from a video posted by YouTube vlogger Lena Morris. In the video, she was portraying a creepy stalker fan of Justin Bieber while singing a song. A screen cap of the video was then submitted on June 2012 in Reddit, and thus the meme was born. Success Kid The meme features a kid with a clenched fist. This meme is usually used to denote success and frustration in a very light tone. The meme traces its origins to a photograph taken off Sammy Grinner by his mom when he was just 11 months old. The photo was actually submitted to Getty Images and was quickly known as the I Hate Sand Castles meme but come 2011, the image would be known as the Success Kid meme. Drum Set when you watch your favorite band during a show, be it live or in video, you really just can't help but notice that one instrument at the back. Yes, it's the drum set. And while it's usually located at the back, there's no denying its presence both audibly and visually. You could even say that the most popular music of the last half of the century has a drum set part in it. Drums and percussion, for the most part, is considered one of the earliest types of instruments probably second only to the human voice. Drums and percussion can be seen in the various cultures throughout the world. The drum set, however, is an evolution of the drum sound and role in music. In the 1800s, the first forerunners of modern drums were from the marching band and the orchestras of the time. Most of these music featured a bass drum, a snare, and some cymbals. These drums were assigned to one player each. But come the 1900s, 
groups would often find themselves smaller and short of extra people to play the other drums. One drummer was assigned to play two drums or a double drum. As the 1900s progressed, so did the music. Drums were now starting to be used as sets, meaning a set of containing a group of drums and percussions. The most notable additions were the toms, which were a type of membrane drum, influenced by Chinese drums, and the cymbals, metallic gong-like percussion with influences from Armenian and Chinese percussion. These were combined together to form a set of drums or a drum set, which gave way to the ones that are in use today. A typical drum set is called a five-piece drum set. It consists of five drum pieces and some cymbals. The five drums are the bass, the biggest piece at the bottom which is operated by a drum pedal. This produces the lowest sound of the kit. The snare, a small drum that has wires running its underside. It produces a distinct cracking sound when hit. And lastly, the toms. These are the three drums of graduating sizes. These produce a distinct round sound and is tuned from a high to low tuning. Together with the drums are the cymbals. A typical drum set includes the following. The hi-hat. The hi-hat is a pair of cymbals that can be opened or closed by another pedal connected to a stand. The crash. A cymbal that produces a loud crash sound. The ride. A larger cymbal with a bigger bell surface. It produces the distinct ringing bell sound when hit. When all the pieces come together, it forms a drum set. Today, the drum set remains as the stable percussion for many styles of music, including rock, pop, jazz, and even R&B. And just like that, the drum set's evolution carries on. Elevator did you know that the elevator was partly responsible for the rise of the modern skyscraper? Think about it. Before elevators, buildings weren't built with more than five stories in the design. But enough of that. Did you know that crude elevators existed well before the industrial age? During the Greek and medieval times, platforms that were similar in function to the elevator were raised and lowered using nothing but a pulley system some rope, counterweights, and of course, good old-fashioned muscle power. As the industrial age came, elevators became powered by steam, and then eventually by electricity. A host of unfortunate accidents in the past would see to it that the modern elevators of today carry numerous safety features. Let's take a look. Well, an elevator is basically a box and pulley system. On the topmost floor is an electric motor and a sheave. Steel cables are lined up across the sheave. One end is connected to the elevator car, while the other is connected to a steel frame that acts as a counterweight. This counterweight is about half the weight of the elevator when full. The sheave is then connected to an electrical motor that turns it one direction for up and the opposite for down. The counterweight acts as a balancer, which keeps the load of the elevator balanced. That way, the motor wouldn't need to exert full force when pulling the elevator car. As statistics goes, riding a modern elevator is pretty safe. There's a very slim 1 in 12 million chance that an accident might happen. But as modern safety laws require, today's elevator comes equipped with a host of safety features that help it stop from plummeting should anything go wrong. First, of course, is the hydraulic brake, a hydraulic mechanism that suddenly snaps back to hold the steel cables. If one cable is cut, this brake will immediately kick in. Another is the extra flywheel. This extra wheel near the motor has a flywheel mechanism that locks into place when the elevator falls at an abnormally fast rate. As the flywheel turns, they lock into an internal groove mechanism, which locks up and hauls the elevator from falling. There's also a safety hatch above the elevator cart, which acts as a maintenance hatch, and in extreme cases can be used as means to access or escape from trapped cars. Most modern elevators also feature an intercom system to facilitate communication from inside the cart if the need arises. 
And while elevators sure make climbing buildings convenient and fast, always remember that they must be avoided in instances like fires, earthquakes, and sudden power outages just to be safe. Allergic Reactions We often think of allergies as a reaction to something in the environment. But really, what does being allergic really mean? For today, we'll be taking a look at allergies and their causes. But first, what is an allergy? An allergy or an allergic disease is the condition that is caused by the hypersensitivity of the immune system to artifacts in the environment. The allergic reaction or the reaction to a trigger in the environment may manifest itself in a variety of ways. These include hay fever, food allergies, atopic dermatitis, allergic asthma, and anaphylaxis. Now, let's take a look at what causes allergies. Allergies may differ from person to person. The thing that triggers an allergic reaction is called an allergen. Some of the most common allergens are foods. Common examples are milk and shellfish, latex, medicines like penicillin, pollen, dust particles, naturally occurring toxic substances like poison ivy, genetic and hereditary factors. Now, how does an allergic reaction occur? When an allergic person comes into contact with an allergen from the environment, their body starts to produce a protein called IgE. This protein then grabs onto the allergen and prompts the body to release chemicals like histamine into the blood. These chemicals are responsible for the symptoms that one feels during an allergic reaction. For the most part, allergies are but a slight inconvenient nuisance, but be wary as some types of allergies may be fatal as well. For people who experience allergies, a type of drug called the antihistamine is medicine that blocks the production of histamine in the body. This may be good for some types of allergies, but not all. In extreme cases, such as anaphylaxis, where the allergic reaction may be fatal, a dose of adrenaline may be administered. Still, the best way to prevent allergies is to detect them early on and try to avoid them as much as possible. One can always consult their doctors to check for any allergies. Some of the most common ways that doctors use are patch testing. For skin allergies, patch testing is the method where adhesive patches are applied with various substances directly to skin, usually at the back or at the forearm. These will be observed for any reaction. Blood testing Doctors may also opt for blood testing, where a patient's blood is sent for lab analysis. Tests measure the concentration of IgE antibodies in the blood. Generally, a high IgE value means a greater likelihood of allergic symptoms. Heavy Metal You either love it or hate it. It's the musical subgenre that takes rock and roll to the extreme. Characterized by loud, really loud instrumentation, blistering fast tempos, and an aggressive in-your-face style. It's the music called heavy metal. The genre was a product of the increasingly popular rock scene of 1960s and the 1970s, and heavily borrows influences from rock and roll, psychedelic rock, and punk rock, and even classical music. Let's take a look at its humble beginnings. In the 1970s, Bands like Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, and Deep Purple would become one of the first and successful bands that would be called heavy metal. The sound was loud and heavily emphasized distorted guitars with influences from rock and blues. Later down the line, another band called Judas Priest came up with a more edgy sound, discarding the blues influence and focusing more on rock and metal sensibilities. This would be followed by acts such as Motorhead, who injected the fast up-tempo influence of punk rock. As the 80s rolled in, heavy metal began to take its own form, even reaching to other parts of the world, such as the UK, dubbed as the new wave of British heavy metal. Meanwhile, back in the US, 
newer bands like Metallica would go on to make heavy metal sound with faster and more aggressive playing styles, which is known as thrash metal. Let's break down some of the most defining characteristics of the heavy metal genre. Distorted guitars and riffing. Part of the heavy metal sound is the distorted guitar. This is achieved when a guitar is amplified to near peak levels. This caused the guitar sound to break and produce a harsh crunch tone. The guitar riff, on the other hand, is a musical composition, which is basically a repeated guitar line or motif that is used in a song. Deep driving bass lines. The bass guitar plays a major role in contributing to the heaviness of heavy metal. Basically, it gives a very deep sound that drives the rhythm for the guitar and drums. Up-tempo drums. Heavy metals puts emphasis on fast drumming and big fills, which adds an aggressive energy to the music that's being played. Aggressive singing style and lyrical content. Heavy metal vocals are very much sung with raw emotion and energy. Sometimes, screaming is employed as well. The lyrics often borders on dark and depressing themes, such as death, violence, war, and similar content. The music and the lyrics are often seen as a stark contrast or counterculture to other mainstream musical genres, such as pop. As the years rolled on, heavy metal influenced new types of metal-inspired music. Calories You'll probably hear people talk about calories, especially when it comes to food, nutrition, and diets. But what do calories really mean? Well, actually, a calorie is a measure for a unit of energy. In thermodynamics, a calorie is the measure of heat, which, as we all know, is a form of energy. The term was first defined in 1824 by Nicholas Clement and is derived from the Latin word calor, which means heat. Now, don't get all confused. A calorie, although a measure of heat energy content, can both be used in chemistry and in food. The calorie, denoted by a small c, is the one that is least used, at least for everyday speed. It is defined strictly as the approximate amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius at a pressure of one atmosphere. In chemistry, calories are used as a measure to denote heat energy released in chemical reactions, but its use is not quite as common. That's because the international SI unit used around the world has superseded the use of the calorie unit in favor of the joule. On the other hand, the other calorie with a capital C is the one that you most likely have heard of. It's also known as the food calorie. This calorie roughly fits the same definition as the other calorie, but with the exception that the food calorie is technically a kilocalorie, meaning that one food calorie is equivalent to 1,000 calories. Now, why is it often used in food? Well, as we all know, people need to eat food because it gives us sustenance and nutrition. As we eat and digest this, we absorb that energy to use for our body's tasks, like walking and lifting objects, and basically everything that we do. Using calories to measure the energy units in food can help us understand better our body's food and energy needs. And most countries require food manufacturers to print this information in the packaging. Now doctors and nutritionists would advise us to eat right and follow a balanced diet. That's because if we put in too much calories from food, the energy from these might be in excess of what the body needs. Once the excess energy is left unconsumed, our bodies store this excess energy as fat. Do you remember the phrase, burn off the excess calories? That's when physical activity comes into play. If you are an active person, then you probably use the calories for the physical activities that you do. But if you are less active, you need to find a way to burn off excess calories, lest they be stored as fat. And we all know that excess fats in the body may lead to poor health. Paper During the last few centuries, 
there are but a handful of inventions that are still being used today. Perhaps, none is as more significant in terms of the scope of use as paper. A precursor to the modern paper, papyrus was made from plant fibers during the ancient Egyptian times. Before its invention, people heavily relied on fresh clay tablets as a medium for written text. But clay was heavy and cumbersome to use, so people sought a better alternative. Despite origins in Egypt, a type of paper much closer to the ones we use today originated in the 2nd century BC in China. Many credit Kai Lun as the inventor. This type of paper was made from the ground-up pulp and fibers from leaves and other plant parts. These were then combined in a water and starch solution and is then placed in a press to create a thin uniform sheet. Through trade, paper made its way to the West and eventually, the invention of the printing press would spur its global production and demand. Here's how paper is typically made. First, you need the raw material for the paper's fiber. This can come from a variety of trees, wastewood products from sawmills, as well as recycled paper. The first thing that is done is to process the raw materials mechanically. Large machines tear and grind the raw materials until they are in the pulpy consistency. Now, depending on the type of paper produced, the pulpiness of the fibers may vary. This will produce paper with various types of thickness and grain. Sometimes, chemicals are also added to aid in the production of the pulp. Once that is done, the pulp is placed in a liquid solution. The solution consists mostly of water and some chemicals, which are used as a binder and may provide special properties for the specific type of paper being produced. Once the pulp and solution is thoroughly combined, a layer of the solution is placed in the screen mold. This will depend on the desired size of the paper to be produced. The screen also lets some of the water drip from the mold. Then, a mechanical press is used to further condense the pulp and form a sheet and is left to dry. The resulting sheet is now paper. You can just imagine how much of the products we use are made of paper. Books, boxes, pamphlets, notepads, newspapers, and the like. But of course, producing paper also means the destruction of trees and forestation. That's why most local governments around the world give incentives and prioritize programs that aim to recycle paper. Remember that most of the paper we use are definitely 100% recyclable, as the fibers in the pulp contain the same materials and composition. Paper is also biodegradable and is seen as an environmentally friendly alternative to plastic. You've just seen another fun and informative episode from Curious. As always, if you have the questions, then we're here with the answers. Stay inquisitive and stay informed. Catch us again next time on Curious.